To Russia's invasion of Ukraine now, support for Ukraine continues as the United States President Joe Biden has announced an additional $2.4 billion military aid package for Ukraine. The announcement was made during a meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky at the White House. The aid includes the first shipment of a precision-guided glide bomb called the Joint Standoff Weapon with a range of up to 81 miles. The medium-range missiles gives Ukraine a major upgrade to the weapons it is using to strike Russian forces, allowing the Ukrainians to do it at safer distances. Right now we have to strengthen Ukraine's position on the battlefield. And that's why today I'm proud to announce a new $2.4 billion package of security assistance. I've also directed the Pentagon to allocate, to allocate all the remaining security assistance funding that has been appropriated to Ukraine, period, by the end of this, my term, which is January 20. And this will strengthen Ukraine's position in future negotiations. Second, uh, we look ahead to help Ukraine succeed in the long term. As you know better than anyone, we, as we said at the Washington summit, we have to support Ukraine in its path to membership to both the EU and to NATO, and continue to make reforms to counter corruption and strengthen democracy, which you're working mightily on right now. We have to ensure Ukraine has sufficient capabilities, and I mean sufficient capabilities, to defend against future Russian aggression. So I'm proud of the steps we've taken in our partnership on these fronts. Earlier this summer, we launched the Ukraine Compact with more than 20 nations committed to Ukraine's long-term security. And yesterday, with over 30 nations and the EU, we launched a joint declaration of support for Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction, some of it using Russian assets as well. And so uh, with both these actions, we make it clear we stand with Ukraine now and in the future. We've got a lot to discuss, so let me close with this. These two elements are critical to how this war ends. Let me be clear. Russia will not prevail in war. Russia will not prevail. Ukraine will prevail, and we'll continue to stand by you every step of the way. We deeply appreciate that Ukraine and America have stood side by side from the very first moments of this terrible Russian invasion. Your determination is incredibly important for us to prevail. Yesterday we had, as you said, we had a G7 plus meeting on Ukraine's reconstruction with more than 30 countries participating, and it was a truly helpful format. We must restore normal life, and we greatly value your leadership, Mr. President. We also have 26 bilateral security agreements with partners based on the G7 security declaration. We have a strong security agreement with the United States, and we are grateful for it, and we will fully implement it. Meanwhile, Mr. Zelensky also met with Vice President Kamala Harris at the White House to discuss his victory plan, which he hopes will pressure Russia into agreeing to a diplomatic end to the war. Mr. Zelensky said all Ukraine needs is just peace, adding that much needs to be done to protect the Ukrainian people, families and children from Vladimir Putin's aggression. The Vice President Kamala Harris reiterated the U.S. stance, saying Washington will continue to stand with Ukraine in its fight against Russia. History has shown us if we allow aggressors like Putin to take land with impunity, they keep going. And Putin could set his sights on Poland, the Baltic states, and other NATO allies. The United States cannot and should not isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. Isolation is not insulation. So then, the United States supports Ukraine, not out of charity, but because it is in our strategic interest. We will continue to provide the security assistance Ukraine needs to succeed on the battlefield. President Zelensky, I am clear. Putin started this war, and he could end it tomorrow if he simply withdrew his troops from Ukraine's sovereign territory. Nothing about the end of this war can be decided without Ukraine. However, in candor, 
I share with you, Mr. President. There are some in my country who would instead force Ukraine to give up large parts of its sovereign territory, who would demand that Ukraine accept neutrality and would require Ukraine to forego security relationships with other nations. These proposals are the same of those of Putin. And let us be clear, they are not proposals for peace. Instead, they are proposals for surrender, which is dangerous and unacceptable. Former U.S. President Donald Trump also met with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. The meeting took place today at the Trump Towers. Mr. Trump says he has a very good relationship with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Mr. Trump has frequently repeated Moscow's talking points about the war, saying if he were president, he would end the war in 24 hours. And so I appreciated that. So we have a very good relationship. And I also have a very good relationship, as you know, with President Putin. And I think uh, if we win, I think we're going to get it resolved very quickly. Very well. I really think we're going to get it resolved. I hope we have more good relations. We're going to have. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, but, you, but, you know, it takes two to tango, you know, and we will, uh, we're going to have a good meeting today. One man has been confirmed dead as Hurricane Helene made landfall in Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis confirmed he was hit by a falling road sign as he urged people to stay indoors. The storm made landfall in Florida's Big Bend, the strongest the region has ever seen, bringing in floods that have put homes under water. Meanwhile, two people have died in Wheeler County in Georgia after a tornado picked up and overturned a mobile home. The hurricane, initially a Category 4, has been downgraded to Category 1 and is headed further inland towards Georgia with maximum wind speeds of 145 kilometers per hour. More than 1.3 million homes and businesses are without power in Florida and a further 460,000 homes in Georgia have also lost power. We have responded to over 200 medical and fire-related calls, anywhere from power lines bound to burning vehicles, burning homes, and as well as any traffic accident, as well as serious medical calls. We currently uh, uh, reached out to the state for additional resources. We have four swift water rescue teams that is staging to assist us. One is coming from Orlando, two is coming from Virginia, and one is coming from Ohio. The water on Davis Island our high rescue vehicles can't even get on Davis Island. So that's, you know, that flooding was what we had warned everyone about. So the, the only way we're getting people off of the island right now is by boat. New York City Mayor Eric Adams has arrived at the Daniel Patrick Monian United States Courthouse in New York for an arraignment hearing. The 64-year-old is facing five counts of criminal offenses, including bribery, wire fraud, and soliciting illegal campaign donations from Turkish nationals. Earlier reacting to the indictment, Mr. Adams said he expected the federal charges as it was not surprising at all. He has denied any wrongdoing, vowing to fight the charges in court. He also resisted calls to step down as mayor of New York. We are not surprised. We expected this. This is not surprising to us at all. The actions that have unfolded over the last 10 months, yeah. the leaks, the commentary, the demonizing, this did not surprise us that we reached this day. 
And I ask New Yorkers to wait to hear our defense before making any judgment. From here, my attorneys will take care of the case so I can take care of the city. My day-to-day -day will not change. I will continue to do the job for 8.3 million New Yorkers that I was elected to do. Amen. And the 300,000 plus employees of our city government will continue to do their jobs, because this is what we do as New York. It's an unfortunate day, and it's a painful day. Yes. But inside of all of that, it's a day when we will finally reveal why for 10 months I have gone through this. And I look forward to defending myself and defending the people of this city as I've done throughout my entire professional career. Right, joining us now is Channel Television's Washington correspondent, Maria Bird. First of all, Maria, how is New York reacting to these criminal charges and the whole of U.S. at large? Well, I think that New Yorkers are a bit surprised. Um, the mayor has been one that has been very much standing for the people throughout his administration. Uh, this has been a mayor uh, that uh, speaks um, that he is for the people, and I think that's what uh, many New Yorkers have held on tight to. And so I think they're looking to see what is going to come out. They know the charges, but they don't know the extent of the prosecutions, um, uh, what their claims are, and how they're indicting him and the charges, the full extent of those. Um, and they're also looking to hear from the mayor, and they're looking to hear from his defense team as to um, how he is claiming not to be guilty. So I think it's a time of um, uh, solidarity within the New York people, but most importantly, they're really hoping to hear um, from their mayor as to actually what has occurred. Maria, what, ex or what do you think is expected to go down at this arraignment? Is the mayor, Eric Adams, likely you know, to take a plea deal? It, it sounds as if, um, if you listen to what he said, that he's not guilty, uh, that he is expecting that he will be able to provide a defense that will allow people to know that he is not guilty of the charges. Um, it does not seem as if he will be taking a plea deal. I think that would be a very different direction uh, that I think is not anticipated at this time. Um, because if you listen to what he's stating, and obviously his team is stating, it's as if uh, the charges are inaccurate from his perspective, um, and that uh, the people of New York will be able to uh, feel as though he is still able to run the city, because as we've heard him state several times, he does not look uh, to uh, remove himself, resign from the position at all. Indeed, you've said correctly there because the mayor seems to be talking tough, saying he's ready to fight the charges. But let's look at some of these charges again, Maria. I mean, it's a 57-page indictment, including bribery, wire fraud, accepting luxury travel and gifts from uh, foreign business people, soliciting illegal campaign donations from Turkish nationals. Maria, do we know if there are going to be any witnesses you know, to give testimony in the long run? It's very likely that there will be witnesses. Um, the prosecution probably has been working on that for quite some time now. Um, and so that is going to most likely be a part of uh, what we'll see. Now, those names will probably not be released until closer to uh, the time of the, uh, when they do go forward with the case. And so, uh, but there will be, and I'm sure the defense team, um, I'm sure that uh, Mayor Adams also has a list of witnesses uh, that he will bring forth um, to uh, claim his defense. So finally, Maria, of course, we know in any criminal case such as this, it is always presumed or one is always presumed innocent uh, uh, before proven guilty. Well, as far as the mayor is concerned, he is uh, confident he has denied any wrongdoing. We also understand that if convicted, the mayor, Eric Adams, could face up to 45 years in prison. Speak to us about the type of mayor he is, actually. We know he's still in office and has already rejected growing calls for his resignation, like you also pointed out uh, a while ago. Yeah, so when you talk about what he's up against, and as you mentioned, the potential, um, the sentencing, if he was convicted, um, that, that he could be facing. And that is, I think, really where uh, the 
the people of New York are going to be looking to hear. They're going to be looking to hear um, what is it that's being charged and really what should be the consequences if uh, the prosecution is is able to prove that he is guilty. And so I think we're, as you said, we're very early in the stages. Charges are the only thing that have been brought forth. It's also another thing we have to take note of is we're in a political season. Um, we know that this is a highly, highly visible, um, historic, many are stating, uh, season of election. Um, and even though we're talking about presidential election, things such as this for the, one of the largest cities in the world and most notably one of the most powerful cities in, in the United States, having this type of um, indictment against the mayor um, who is a definite one that would be um, bringing spotlight to the Democratic Party um, is something I think that Americans are also considering um, and one that I'm sure his defense is considering as well as they're looking at ways to, um, to create their defense. Um, so this is um, something that I think he's stating he'll be able to continue to run the city. Um, I think that the, the people are hopeful that he can uh, because we are, many Americans are transitioning back. Um, it's been a long time coming uh, to revitalize the U.S. economy. Um, and so they're hopeful that he will be able to continue to work um, despite what's going on uh, with the indictments. Maria, thank you indeed for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on now, Japan's ruling party has elected Shigeru Ishiba as its new leader, positioning the former defense chief as Japan's next prime minister. Speaking after securing the party's election, he says he would clean up his liberal democratic party, the LDP, and address security threats in the country. The 67-year-old incoming prime minister stressed the need for the country's economy to fundamentally exit a deflationary spiral and vowed to take steps to boost wages in a sign his near-term focus would be to keep activity on a sustained recovery track. Nine candidates contested for the party leadership after Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced last month that he will not stand for re-election. Here in Nigeria, the World Food Programme, WFP, through the Africa Youth Growth Foundation, AYGF, has launched a wheat distribution project to assist over 68,000 vulnerable households in Katsina State. The distribution began with a small ceremony in Kurfi local government area and was attended by the executive director, AYGF, Dr. Arom Salifu, the senior special assistant to the Katsina State Governor, Miriam Sudangi, and other dignitaries. Dr. Salifu expressed his gratitude to the World Food Programme, the Katsina State Government and the host communities, appreciating the joint efforts to address the growing crisis of food insecurity. The project is targeted towards five local government areas, all in a bid to reduce food insecurity caused by banditry and violence in the region. Uh, we thank the state governor uh, for the support and also the security agencies for the enabling environment to make this a reality. We also want to thank the traditional rulers, the religious leaders, uh, the local government officials for the mobilization of their followers and subjects to uh, receive the commodities. Uh, we, of course, must not forget to thank the World Food Program for providing the commodity on one side and also providing the necessary technology and modalities to ensure logical and smooth you know, distribution of these commodities. Uh, persons have been logically identified and picked to truly ensure that people who truly are affected are the ones receiving these commodities. President Bola Tinubu has called on African nations to adopt a new agenda that prioritizing adding value to her raw minerals to industrialize the continent and provide sustainable economic growth. This was put forward by Vice President Kashim Shatima at the African Mineral Strategy Group meeting on the sidelines of the ongoing 79th session of the UN General Assembly in New York. Our CEDAS correspondent, Larry Lassisi, has this report on the event and, of course, other meetings taking place at the ONGA. Vice President Kashim Shatima 
arriving for the African Mineral Strategy Group meeting taking place on the sidelines of the ongoing 79th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York, United States. The Minister of Solid Minerals Development, who is the chairman of the group, laid out the group's vision to transform Africa's mining industry through local value addition and industrialization. By moving from commercialization to industrialization, we expand the capital formation of the mineral sector, increase employment of the people, provide opportunities for skills acquisition, facilitate the production of finished goods for local consumption and exports, reduce our reliance on imported products, and ultimately raise the contribution of the solid mineral sector to our GDP. The Vice President, delivering President Bola Tinubu's address at the event, points out the critical need for a new approach. He further emphasized Africa's determination to move beyond the historic exploitation of its resources. It is evident that Africa is desirous of shaking up the toga of requests for aid and grants, a situation in which the raw materials are extracted from our countries, exported, refined, and sold to us as finished products at higher prices merely consolidates the foundations of our military and pushes us further down the depths of underdevelopment. We seek to break, to break free by localizing the whole mineral resource value chain from extraction to processing and then to sales within our countries. We have skilled men and women. Other meetings held around the city where reports were presented and agreements reached. We also have a position statement where young people have given their opinions on the challenges for um, why young people are not able to um, key into that and also recommended solutions. So we shared that position at different forums, at different side events, and we've also taken the takeaways to be able to uh, ensure that we are able to intimate young people in Nigeria. We are trying to make sure that the mistake with the SDGs don't reoccur. The SDGs, most young people are um, waking to it late. This report you know, um, came up with some set of uh, recommendations uh, suggesting to the government to take more proactive action so that we are able to achieve sustainable development goal, goal 16. Because without taking those, you know, uh, recommendation uh, to improve in our institutions, to improve in our judicial system, to improve in the anti-corruption, uh, it will be extremely difficult for us to make the necessary progress and even achieve the sustainable development goal in Nigeria. I think the biggest impact for Nigeria has been just our sheer presence here. Uh, Nigeria being a leader in Africa has uh, shown leadership uh, in the, our presence, our message and our dialogue and uh, just our general communication with other um, countries, heads of states, um, foreign missions, and especially the business community. These side events are a crucial part of the annual gathering here at the General Assembly, complementing the former sessions and in their own way, contributing to making the world a better place. From New York, Lanre Lassese, Channels Television News. The 8th China Home Life South Africa is currently underway in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, this year's edition is showcasing over 500 suppliers with 800 booths displaying nearly 14,000 products. This will give South African importers an opportunity to directly access products from Chinese manufacturers. However, some economists already argue that the heavy reliance on Chinese products may make African economies vulnerable to external shocks and even reduce their ability to develop self-sustaining industries. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, reports. Africa's large and growing population offers a substantial market for Chinese goods and investment. Now in its eighth year, China Home Life South Africa brings together importers and suppliers in one location. The event is organized by Binu Pele, COO of Marriott International Exhibition. So um, I, I think we are kind of maintaining a similar size, plus or minus 10 or 15 percent, I would say. Uh, we have about 350 exhibitors this year. Last year, we probably had about 320. 
the chief executive officer of Volt High Tech Solutions South Africa, Kathy Shilova, says China-South Africa relations is vitally important. So South Africa and China, they enjoy a very great relationship. As you know, the past two weeks, three weeks, actually government of South Africa and some of our business in South Africa, they were in China forging different relationships. Meanwhile, Vincent Yongdong from Wenzhou Yongdong Machinery shares the same sentiments. This, okay, I'm, busy, I'm a businessman. So Africa is very good market, you know. Everything, you know, it's, it's, I, I see young people on every street. Economist Magwema Selela believes China's increasing exports to Africa can have several disadvantages for the continent. As a country or a continent buying a lot of things from other countries or continents, it means that that particular country that you are buying from, in this instance, if say it's China, that Africa is buying a lot of things from them, it means China itself, its economy is growing in the sense that, that those people that are selling stuff to us, it means they've created the necessary jobs. Minoral trade analyst Viwe Nchongwana had this to say. Chinese goods uh, are made relatively cheaply and enter the African market cheaply. Uh, they flood or, or tend to flood certain African markets, undercutting um, certain um, similar goods that have been manufactured uh, in Africa, and that undercutting reduces the demand of the similar goods that have been manufactured in Africa. This ongoing dialogues about the benefits and risks of uh, such partnerships is essential as Africa navigates its economic future. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Simons, Channels Television. There's no doubt about the improvements tech has brought to the education sector from personalized learning systems to interactive online platforms that enhance the learning experiences of students. The mobile classroom is one of such apps that's aiming to bridge the learning gap for both secondary and tertiary students while ensuring the preservation of the intellectual property of educators on the platform. In today's world, learning is changing with tech, making it as dynamic as the students it serves. That's where the mobile classroom app comes in, a platform that puts on-the-go learning right at the fingertips of Nigerian students. According to the founder, Akeem Salami, the app was born out of a desire to bridge learning gaps using technology. It's actually an e-learning platform that was actually put in place like almost four or five years ago. So then it was actually for secondary school students where we put up like almost 1,000 video content for secondary school. But in the recent time, we extended the opportunities to tertiary institutions, the lecturers and high institutions, coaches and facilitators anywhere. Built by a team passionate about learning, this app brings the classroom straight into the pockets of both students and lecturers. We have uh, different lecturers that are lecturers on the platform too. Creating a space where students can engage with their studies anytime while also supporting educators to share their knowledge beyond their schools. There are two major things we have considered. Number one is that uh, we look at uh, how lecturers have been empowered. We, how can they take advantage of technology to advance their well-being? So we feel if lecturers can have a space of their own to preserve their intellectual asset, it means that students of other schools who do not have the privilege to attend Unilag will have the opportunity to take lecture from a lecturer at Unilag for as long as the lecturer can take him better. So we are trying to bring uh, intra, inter institutional expectations of intellectual material that it can be a student of Mayapatek mass communications and be taking lecture from a student of uni learning, lecturer of uni learning. So this is what we have thought of to put this. And secondly, we also understand that with the way things are going in the world, flexibility is a key thing that we have to consider. Many students have to work and learn. And how do they combine this if there is a schedule time for them to take the lecture? So if lecturers have put up their lecture video on their lecture space, Students at their own convenient time can have access to this content. So in this case, we feel them having access to their lecturers, their content, 
their lecture material video or audio base at their own convenient time we enhance learning unique features of the app like my class and virtual tests that aim to make the learning and teaching process easier here educators can create personalized classes and upload lecture materials and students can revisit these lessons at their own pace my class is just a replica of a spotify that is available for musicians well, my class is for lecturers to upload their intellectual materials recorded so that their students can have the opportunity to reassess their lecture at their own convenient time. It's a kind of empowerment for lecturers too. Why also making learning easy for people? Why the virtual test is just to test people, just like the lecturers in our institutions want to conduct the assessment test. And they have to go through the rigors of writing tests on paper, marking and recording. Now they can conduct their assessment test virtually. While the platform is more than just a tool, but an opportunity for both lecturers and students to stay on track with their academic goals, for students, the mobile classroom app means access to hundreds of lessons on any device, any time they want, and for lectures. It's a chance to extend their reach beyond traditional institutions, which is a win-win for both sides. The beauty of technology, wouldn't you say? Well, finally on the program, we did promise to bring you the story. Well, the Teletubbies are back, but not on your television screens. But no worries, as you can catch Tinky, Winky, Dipsy, Lala and Pooh at the Soho Gallery in London. The exhibition tour, tagged the House of Teletubbies, has been transformed into a celebration of the four cartoon characters many grew up watching. Teletubbies, a British children's television show, first hit the screens on March 31st, 1997, beaming into sets from their fictional home, Teletubby Land. The content has since been broadcast in more than 190 countries all over the world, or over the years rather, and has even translated into many languages. And that's the world today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ayo Tunde. Hello.